the muzzleloaders.com podcast, your source for all things muzzleloading. How's it going, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Muzzleloaders podcast, the show where we talk about anything and everything muzzleloading. Uh, we have Caleb and Hunter with us today, and we are going to be talking about traditional muzzleloader hunting. Yes. And not just that, but how to get started, why it's interesting, uh, the things that you'll need to know before beginning. So why don't we get started, and we'll kind of start at the very beginning with you guys. What is considered a traditional muzzleloader? I would say just the ignition system, right? You is a big part of it. Yeah. Um, traditional muzzleloading is you either have the, well, old school percussion system or a flintlock ignition. Yeah, typically. I think the other side of it would be probably rifle design and how the barrels are manufactured because a lot of them have those long, slow twist rates in them for shooting round ball. Mm -hmm. um, some of them have kind of those hybrid rates as well for mm -hmm. those older style conicals. So a few different features there. And then, yeah, I would say the ignition's primarily the the main differential there uh, because it's off to the side. Side lock muzzleloaders are typically like what we think about when we're talking about traditional muzzleloaders. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess what is the, why is it still relevant today? Because in the world that we live in today, we have the Paramount Pro, we have, the, you know, the 40 cal, we have the the new Knight Peregrine, we have the Remington 700, like these muzzle loaders mm -hmm. that are able to reach out to distances of 400 yards easy, you know, why is it that traditional muzzle loading has survived for so long? Because we've seen traditions, they mm -hmm. have continued to make them, Lyman, Petter Soli. Why is that still happening today, you guys think? Well, I think the main reason is because people like to get back to history, trying to get mm -hmm. back to what it was like before we had all the mm -hmm. high powered guns because i know even you know even those new inline muzzle loaders that you were talking about they of course can shoot a lot further they're still black powder so it's not quite the same as shooting like a center yeah. fire rifle but you know as far as once you've got the gun loaded you've mm -hmm. only got one shot but that one shot is pretty much like shooting a you know <laughs> your regular yeah. 30-06 yeah. or whatever it's good to go forever and you can shoot pretty much as far as you want these guns or it's like, why do people love archery season? Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. <laughs> people like to do it because it's harder. It's more challenging. Mm -hmm. uh, it gets back to a more primitive style of mm -hmm. hunting. I think people really like that. There's a big push right now. I've actually talked to a lot of people just in general in our community. There's a big push to go back to a lot more traditional stuff. Um, you know, just people like to raise animals and people like to do a lot of, you know, more of the homesteading type mm -hmm. of things. Mm -hmm. Uh, not completely, you know, but getting a feel for that, you know, getting more hands-on with their food, you know, getting more hands-on with yeah. just everything that they're doing less detached. I think traditional muzzle loading gets you right up close and personal, mm -hmm. and it gets you a gun in your hands. It's like, man, this is an old-looking gun. <laughs> That's yeah. something our ancestors used when they mm -hmm. were making this country, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. I would say I've, I've talked to a lot of people who started – you know, traditional hunting with a, a centerfire rifle. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, they've, okay, I've hunted for 20 years with a centerfire rifle. I want that challenge. Yeah. Jump into black powder and then eventually go even further They're and go like to regressing. traditional hunting. Yeah. yeah intentionally. Cause mm -hmm. it's like, well, I've already done all this stuff. I mm -hmm. want that extra experience, the extra um, challenge, of course. But yeah. there's just something with, you know, shooting a traditional muzzleloader and that powder going off poof, and, you yeah. know, that big <laughs> yeah. plume of smoke um, in your face and, you know, did I get it? And then the, the smoke clears and... And there's the added component of you don't know <laughs> if your gun's going to go off right when you pull the trigger. Sure. So that always yeah, yeah. makes it more challenging as well. I think another great example is the states of Oregon and Idaho. Look at their laws. Mm -hmm. Clearly, and those were pushed by sportsmen. Yeah. Right? It's not like Oregon just came out and said, oh, yeah you know, the, you know, muzzleloader season is just going to be, you know, old school muzzleloaders just because mm -hmm. we think that's a good idea. It used to be, you could use whatever you wanted, but there's been a big push mm -hmm. in the muzzleloading community in Oregon and in Idaho to use more traditional stuff during the muzzleloader season. Yeah. So those states regulate it. You have to use the old school guns or a very primitive version of an inline. I think there's, there's a little bit of a pride thing too, where some of the could traditional be. hunters, it's like, oh, I took a, I took this animal down with a flintlock muzzleloader. You have mm -hmm. to use this modern inline <laughs> muzzleloader to take a, you know, this is what I did. You know, you yeah. kind of have that. Well, it is a little bit of a brag. I mean, think about <laughs> yeah, that. It it's is. like, it is. hey, check this out. I just, 
killed this awesome buck or elk and I killed it with this. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I had, the, I snuck up within 50 yards of yeah, it, you know, yeah. so you can't shoot them from very far yeah. away with those, you know, they've got iron sights on them that aren't even, I mean, they barely stick up above the barrel and it's yeah, like, it's that yeah. big muzzleloader flex you can mm-hmm. do. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's kind of the ultimate challenge there killing something with a flintlock. Yeah. And it changes how you move because if you start with a compound bow and you move to a traditional bow, you're looking at, being able to take something down like 60 yards, yeah. now you're looking at 20 yards. Right. You know, it's the yeah. same thing, same kind of switch when you're going from a, a inline to a traditional muzzleloader. And so how does how you hunt the animals change? You know, Because obviously if you, it's a lot easier to spot and stalk when you have that extra 300 yards that you can yeah, play right. with as far right. as taking it down. Well, I, I think you have to be a lot more clever and a lot more tactical on how Mm -hmm. you go out in the woods because you know a lot of these traditional style they don't have a breech plug you're not able to access the powder or the the round ball or the bullet once it's loaded so it's like you you have to put your powder down there first (laughs) absolutely so so you have to be very meticulous on how you proceed yeah (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) you have to be very meticulous to make sure that hey when i pull this trigger i have the best chance of my powder going off and my my projectile hitting the target Mm -hmm. and so um, you got to be a lot more strategic, I think, before you even go out, before you even step into the woods. You do, yeah. and I think you you can't just go crashing through the woods. Yeah. You know, and a lot of people, I know I've done a lot of spot and stock hunting, so it's a lot of go out, find a high place, look around, see where the animals are at, mm-hmm. try to close the gap enough to get a shot. Mm-hmm. You're not really worried about it because they're usually several hundred yards away yeah. by the time you find them anyway. Yeah. Maybe not. You know, but then you're you're kind of just moving like in a tree line. But when you have to get within a hundred yards or closer, that's a totally different ball game. Yeah, mm-hmm. you have to plan it out. You have yep. to see, hey, that's a wide open meadow they're in. Is there any way I can even get up to them? Mm-hmm. No. Okay, I got to figure out where they're moving and when they're going to move, yeah. and and hope I can get positioned to where they're going to come within that distance. And that's know, the so. fun because I think when I switched from rifle hunting to archery hunting for elk the first thing that caught my attention was this is, you know, for elk hunting, it's more about where are the animals? How can I get a shot on an animal that I want with archery hunting? It's a game of chess and it's my intelligence versus the animal's intelligence. And how can I manipulate the wind and how can I manipulate the landscape and try and move Mm -hmm. into a position where I thought, Oh, I think he's going to come through here. And so I think that is the, that is the big appeal of Mm -hmm. traditional muzzle loading. So you have, like Hunter said, you have the, uh, the traditional aspect of it, just it's nature. You have the, you know, frontiersmen that used it and you're kind of connecting with that, the roots, Mm -hmm. you have the challenge of it, you know? And so I think those are kind of the big appeals of traditional muzzle loading, but that kind of begs the question is like, is there any advantage to it? Like, is there any, like if somebody's just looking to muzzle loader hunt, is there any advantage to using a side lock versus an inline? Yeah, I think it depends because there are definitely some situations in where I think it actually could be more advantageous. Typically, it's more of a hindrance, but um, there are situations where, one, you can be limited to that. For mm-hmm. instance, Pennsylvania has a flintlock only season. Yes. So that's a great opportunity to get an extra week of hunting in. I don't know. It could be longer than that. I'm not 100% sure how long the season is, but you get extra hunting time in mm-hmm. is the point. But you can only use a flintlock weapon. Yeah. So there's obviously one area where you just, that's what you can use. Um, But additionally, I think, you know, like in Oregon or Idaho, where you have regulations that are already geared trying to get you to use those kind of guns anyway, you can manipulate a inline rifle to make it Northwest compliant. Um, But there are actually some better side lock rifles out there i think Mm -hmm. um one that comes to mind would be the like the petter Soli missouri river hawken Mm -hmm. that one's got a one and 24 inch twist right in the barrel so you can shoot like your power belts or whatever you know you're good Mm -hmm. you know conical projectiles Mm -hmm. through it um and you know it's it's a good reliable gun petter Soli makes phenomenal rifles yeah um so it's gonna go off for you and that gun actually can shoot further than some of the inline guns that you would have to convert it's true. Uh, to yeah. use in, you know, Idaho or Oregon. So yeah. there are instances where it can actually be advantageous for you to go that route. Mm-hmm. I actually sold one of those to a, a guy in Idaho the other day. Um, and we talked about some of the inline guns. And after kind of working through all of it, we're like, mm-hmm. now this one I think is going to be a better option for you. Yeah. It's can, it can get you more range. Yeah, I think that they look better too. 
They are cool. And that matters. That does it matter. Does. It does. It does. It does matter. True. The deer isn't going to notice the difference between yeah. a modern inline and a side lock, but mm -hmm. just something that, hey, I can take this perfectly functional um, flint lock or percussion rifle out in the woods, take down a deer, come back and hang it on my wall, and it, it looks beautiful. It's true. It the wood a stock. A lot of them. A lot of them have, yeah, some beautiful brass or just metal furniture built into the stock. So, yeah, it's just, it's personal preference is what it boils down to mm -hmm. a lot of times. Yeah. But, yeah, like you said, there's there's plenty of opportunities that, that flintlock and percussion do an amazing job. Yeah. I think it's a totally different feel, too. It is. Yeah. When you're shooting a traditional gun, it, it feels very different. Even yeah. with the percussion models, it's still... You know, it's pretty instantaneous on mm -hmm. the ignition, but it's yeah. not the same as shooting an inline or even a regular, you know, center fire mm -hmm. rifle. Yeah. You pull the trigger and you expect the gun to go off, right? Right when you pull the trigger. Yeah. It doesn't really work that way. It's pretty close with a side lock uh, percussion. It's not mm -hmm. like that at all with a flint lock. <laughs> flint yeah. locks yeah. are like, even when they work like they're supposed to, it's like a quarter to a half second delay, it seems like. Yeah. And so, which is very noticeable when you're expecting it to go off right yeah. when you squeeze the trigger so and there are some ways you can mitigate the disadvantages of it too sure. like the traditions pa pellet you know that allows you to use pelletized powder that's true which is a huge advantage um and there's ways you can mitigate that delay too because i know the different type like say you're using 3f is your pan powder that's right. definitely not going to work as well so yeah and, and like hunter said even at optimal you're still going to have a, some it's more like delay the than than in you yeah. know than anything else but yeah, uh, there's ways to mitigate it too. And so let's go ahead and do Caleb our tech tip of the day. Okay. Um, it's something we had mentioned just in passing in other podcasts, but uh, this tech tip of the day is kind of a no brainer. It's organization mm -hmm. and uh, just talking about lining out all of your stuff. This especially applies to traditional muzzle loading yeah. when you're using, you know, when having a dry ball actually matters. You can't just remove the breech plug and push it out the back of the barrel. You have to make sure everything is lined out correctly. Um, and so, you know, line it out in order of priority. So start with your powder and then your powder measure and then your patches and your ball and then your percussion cap. So that way you just like work your way down the line, have mm -hmm. everything nice, clean, organized. And then when you're in the field, same principle, you know, use speed loaders, use paper cartridges, have everything organized in such a way that, you know, when the adrenaline's pumping, you have that animal in front yeah. of you and you're not just like rifling through your possibles bag, trying to get your stuff. And, you know, cause it's all going to be muscle memory. It's the same, you know, same way yeah. you practice. It's all going to be muscle memory when the adrenaline's pumping. So that's yeah. kind of our tech tip of the day. I don't know if you guys had anything else you wanted to add to that. Well, just, just being organized in when you go out to the range, especially is practice. Mm -hmm. Like for sure, like organize everything. Like you said, how you're going to load your muzzleloader properly mm -hmm. and then practice that, practice that. Cause if you're going, like you said, in a hunting scenario where everything's heightened, your adrenaline's up, yep. you have a chance to get a second shot per chance. Mm -hmm. Um, you want to make sure you're loading the powder first and then you have a patch with a round ball that's going in next. Cause if, you know, if you skip a step and you, like you said, you dry ball and you mm -hmm. shove a ball down there before you put your powder, then you're in a world of hurt. And you, you won't be can't. getting that extra shot, no. that's for sure. No. <laughs> and the deer's not going to hear a around. pop, maybe a thunk if you're lucky, and that bullet came back. <laughs> or out, even, but. even if you know halfway down when you're loading the round ball, and you're like, oh, I didn't put powder in, it's already too late. Yeah. You're not going to have time to pull it back out. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, just practice, practice, because um, you can develop that muscle memory when you're out in the field. One thing I've thought of, too, is, is replicating that adrenaline surge by using a shot timer. Because mm. when I do pistol yeah. training, I use a shot timer. Um, I don't actually have one, but I use a buddy's, and we got and trained together. And that actually replicates the adrenaline because, like, I got to beat my time. Mm. And, you know, obviously you want to make sure you're being safe when you're first starting out. But when you're, like, when you have everything organized and you're going to try and replicate the, you know, scenario of being hunting, you want to make sure you're in a controlled environment practicing that instead of just going into that environment yeah. blind, you know. So that'd be a great way to, you know, a good thing to try too, if you're really serious about it. So yeah. And the other, I guess one last thing I'd tack on there is just make sure you've got all the accessories you might need, mm -hmm. you know, bullet puller being one of those, a patch puller with For these sure. guns. Yeah. With you can't quickly access the barrel. Mm -hmm. You need to have stuff you can fish things out of the barrel yeah. with. So just make sure you've got everything you need when you're going. Yeah, and that kind of brings up the accessories that we want to talk about too, yeah. because some of the accessories that you need to carry 
while hunting with a traditional muzzleloader are different from with an yeah. inline, for instance. So for sure, um, let's kind of talk about a few of those we have on here. Uh, the first one is your projectiles. They are going to be different in most circumstances. Yeah. So. Mm-hmm. Like round balls yeah. are primarily what you're going to be using. Again, it depends on the twist rate of your rifle. It does, mm-hmm. and there's a lot of different barrels out there these days. Absolutely. Yeah. And and even then, um, a lot of these f- quicker twist rate traditional style rifles, most of the time they will use like a solid lead projectile still. So yeah. In, in, in most circumstances, they work the shape. best. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And so, you know, that's still going to be kind of the old school style bullet. And so it's it's good to have those on your person. Absolutely, you know, you have a really cool accessory to hold your projectiles. It's like a, a round ball holder. Oh yeah, which I I've never grabbed that. Pouch. Yeah, it's just yeah. right over there. I'll have to grab it before yeah. the end of the podcast. Which I yeah. I didn't know existed <laughs> until you brought it back from your rendezvous. And it like, is That's, cool. Yeah. That is a really cool tool, and it makes yeah. sense. Just a container to hold your round balls. Yeah, it's super handy. Just sling it over your yeah. neck, and off you go. Mm-hmm. Yep. And one thing too is I would I would consider us all experts in muzzle loading. But if you are looking for like, you know, just very, you know, I went to the rendezvous and they had accessories that I'd never even seen before. Yeah. So a lot of the stuff is handmade, you mm-hmm. know, and all that. So if you're looking for advice on like traditional muzzle loading and stuff, absolutely give us a call. But if you're looking for specific accessories and things, go to a local rendezvous because they have yeah. all kinds. I mean, you'll find people that are hand making these things that are of just phenomenal quality. And so I'll actually, I'll put a picture of that, that. Uh, ball bag on the top of the screen here if you're watching on YouTube so you can kind of check it out that's yeah. actually one thing I'm glad you brought that up because that's something I talk to a lot of our customers about mm-hmm. though you know very common thing I get when people call in is hey I'm brand new to muzzle loading here's my hunting season here's mm-hmm. what I'm doing what do I need yeah and what I always tell them is like hey let's get you outlined with what you're gonna absolutely need yeah. but I don't want to overload you with other stuff and the reason sure. why is because there's a lot of accessories out there. Some are going to be helpful to you. Some you may not like, yeah. and it's personal preference on mm-hmm. a lot of that stuff. So I get you. I you know my approach is to get what you absolutely need, uh, and then you can adjust your setup as you go. What's going to work best mm-hmm. for you? So for sure, yeah, definitely be thinking about those things if you're thinking about getting into you know some traditional hunts uh, that are coming up, or even if you're going to go rendezvous shooting or whatever you're yeah. doing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We have also we have powder and primers. Um, that's going to differ some, I mean, you're, it's honestly with between flint lock and percussion, that's obviously going to be a huge difference because with yeah. a flint lock, you're not going to need yeah. primer. You're going to need a different type of priming powder, mm-hmm. uh, which we recommend using a four FG powder because mm-hmm. any other is going to, if you use like three F for instance, it's going to delay and it might not go off every time. So it's, yeah. it's definitely best to just get the four F powder and, through all of this primer shortage, that's an advantage that actually I didn't think about, but through all this like primer shortage that we've mm-hmm. been seeing, the flintlock enthusiasts, you know, I see them on Instagram. I see you. I know who you are. You're always like, <laughs> you're still going. Yeah. It's like I, you, they're shooting with rocks and powder. And yeah. so they're, they have yeah. been for the most part unaffected by this whole primer shortage. So that, that reminds me of when we were talking about, I think it was the Hawk and Rifle podcast. We were yeah. talking about, um, yeah, all the mountain men are like, no, I want the flintlock version, yeah. even though the percussion was yeah. available because they couldn't get percussion caps a lot of the time. Yeah, they were so short supply. You're reliving the the history now, whether exactly. you want to or not. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, that's a huge advantage uh, using, you know, with traditional. So, mm-hmm. um, but as far as like per- percussion caps go, most of your modern percussion caps are either going to use a musket or a number 11. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's going to vary. You're going to want to use or two. Both. You can switch. It's true. The, you yeah. can switch the nipple out typically yeah. on those if yeah. you want to use either one. And musket is going to be a little bit hotter. Uh, so yes. if you have the option to use a musket cap, that's going to be more consistent for you. Mm-hmm. Um, and so let's see. Let's look at some of these other accessories that I put on here. So I had just some cursory ones like a nipple wrench, uh, definitely important because, like we experienced at our range day the other day, sometimes yeah. your nipple gets clogged up with stuff, and you know sometimes you're not able to get it all cleaned out with a nipple pick. Sometimes it's really jammed in yeah. there. So definitely want to be, have the ability to remove that. And all of these accessories are just going to make your trip easier because if you get out there's nothing worse than getting out in the field and realizing you don't have the tools that you need and your entire trip's a bust and so that's that's i speak from experience that's the worst (laughs) feeling in the whole world yeah um a nipple pick and sometimes you can get the nipple wrench and nipple pick yes combo like our our mz 1211 uh, yeah the mz 1211 combo Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, we're speaking in parts and part numbers yeah. here. <laughs> <laughs> you can look that up on our website. Yep. It'll pull yeah. that up for you. And yep. I, I would even say um, something you don't have written down is just replacement nipples. That, I for was sure. going to say that yeah. too. Because yep. that's that up. kind of going to function as like a, a breech plug-esque. You know, mm-hmm. it's the removable part that channels your fire into where your powder is. And so yep. if that gets yes. dinged or the, the um, percussion cap can't seat on there properly... It's like you might need to have just a replacement you screw on really quick. And I've yeah. talked to people too. Sometimes they wear out, right? So after yeah. you've used them, I've talked to a lot of people that it, the hammer falls on it and it breaks, like it cracks True. or yeah. something too because they've just been used a lot. And that's yeah. pretty normal. Mm-hmm. Although if you get like the stainless steel ones that they hold up a lot the, longer. The newer ones, so. yeah, the newer yeah. ones are designed to hammer, well, have more repeated hammer hits on it but yeah. i remember the original ones eventually they would mushroom out yeah they mm-hmm. kind of just yeah. they would mush and, down. and if you're yeah. not getting that good seal between your cap and and the nipple then it won't go off yeah exactly mm-hmm. yeah so yeah that's a good note caleb um that's why i bring you guys on because i am a fallible <laughs> human being again just a testament of there's going to be a ton of accessories and so exactly. there are there's so yeah. many yeah and we do have our traditional hunter kit so a few weeks ago on the podcast mm-hmm. uh with colton we went over the inline hunter kit. Yes. We have another version of that. Uh, I don't have one with me, unfortunately. I didn't think of it till now. You could just Photoshop yep. the little thing Photoshop right it right here. The but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's uh, the traditional hunter kit, which is very similar. It has all of the accessories that you need, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the, to, before you go out into the field. Um, a bullet starter is one. That's one that we recommend yep. across the board. There's Everybody a few. Needs those. Yeah, it's just a one that's always needed, no matter what you're doing. Yep. Um, a capper. That's kind of situational. Mm. If you're using a, per, a percussion cap muzzle or ugh, a percussion muzzle loader, um, <laughs> then you're going to want to use a capper because I've had it happen with my thumb. One, it hurts. You know, you're, once you're 13, 14 yeah. shots in, trying to push the cap on, and two, it's dip, as it gets grimed up on the nipple, it's difficult to make sure that's seated correctly. And so, that well, even even if there's a little bit of debris on the nipple, mm-hmm. it's hard to load a cap because yeah. you're working yeah. with such fine measurements. Like it needs to seat, and really, a capper functions kind of like a cheater bar. It gives yeah. you just yeah. a little more leverage to mm-hmm. properly do that, and it's safe to load, and it hold it stores some of them eight to ten caps yeah. that you just have at the ready. So yeah, very crucial. And that's one of those accessories that a lot of inline hunters ask, "Do I need one of these?" And like, eh, maybe you know, it's mm-hmm. not as crucial with that with side locks. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And they do make them for musket and number eleven yep. percussion caps. Yes. So whichever one you need, or number tens, or number too, tens so. too. Yep. Yeah, so it's a little trickier with the revolvers. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure yep. with the revolvers. That's a whole other podcast. With, yeah, with yeah, that's another traditional pistol story for another time. <laughs> <laughs> um, and let's see. So we had cleaning patches, pretty standard. Yep. Um, a powder measure. You need some kind of way to measure measure your powder, uh, whether it's pre-measured into speed loaders or what you're doing with it uh and then a powder flask so we've talked about the funnel cap that turns your your container into Mm -hmm. a powder flask or you can buy an actual powder flask i i would actually recommend a powder flask for traditional hunting Mm. and the reason is is a lot of times the spouts that come with it are are already measured out to a specific increment so so some of the spouts are 30 grains for example and Mm -hmm. since you're using significantly less powder in certain circumstances in traditional it's nice to have like you kind of have a little built-in mini measure into your your powder flask yeah Yeah. and it also matches the aesthetic because a lot of these tools are like those cool brass Mm -hmm. accessories so they Mm -hmm. match your gun it's just part of the the entire experience well, I talking think. about aesthetics if you really want a cool powder flask and get a powder horn yeah those that's are, right those there are real go. cool yep. <laughs> and on that note at a rendezvous you there's actually little kits that you can buy that turn your powder horns into like a powder flask so you have a little button oh, wow i've seen those that those you are can cool turn yeah, that's and they, awesome. yeah and they have like the measured spout like you're talking about yep, so you have the spring Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's so cool. Yeah. Those are pretty sweet. So um, you can definitely check out some of those. Um, that's actually not a product that we have, but maybe we will coming get soon. Like that maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I, there was one thing that yeah. that we we touched base on, but I wanted to to throw it in really quick. So obviously, with flintlock, you're not going to be using a cap mm-hmm. or a primer. You're going right. to be using an actual piece of flint. So having extra flints yes. is important, and then also having a leather jaw pad. Or mm-hmm. some people use lead, but just having an extra grabber basically will will fit around the flint. So yep. when it's in your hammer, it's not going to damage the flint when it basically the metal yeah. of the hammer is not going to contact the stone, so it'll yeah. it'll break. So, Yo, uh, yeah, and the big thing there is it gets it 
it grabs it because yes. those stones are slick. Exactly. And so when those two, you know, steel jaws, it's really easy when they make contact with the frizzin to fly out there mm-hmm. or chip off or whatever. Yeah. yeah. So don't having wanna, don't want to shatter it on your first shot. Extra of both of those is crucial. Yep. So here's a second little tech tip, yep. little bonus tech tip. Ooh. Um, yeah, bonus tech tip of the day. So with those jaw pads, um, if you cut a little notch in the back, so when you fold it over, there's a notch there. And you can make it such that the, the what's that screw called, Caleb? The, the top, jaw, just the, the jaw, jaw screw. screw yeah. yeah, such that the jaw screw is resting directly on the on the flint. One that's going to absorb the because the the leather will absorb some of the impact, so you're not getting as direct contact. Um, and so, so that, it, uh, that's just kind of like a little tip. It's going to make it just a little bit more consistent that's for cool. you. And so it won't move that flint back. Either. Yeah, it's yeah. not going to give it that cushion. So just yeah, something to you know for Sweet. you guys to think about. Um, Cool. So let's go ahead and do a new segment that we are doing today. And uh, the segment is, yes, (laughs) it's called Blowing Smoke. So I'm going to make a true or false statement, and you two are going to have to decide whether or not I'm telling the truth or if I'm blowing smoke. So the statement, uh, this is, and it's all about like frontiersmen, different muzzleloading facts and things like that. So great. uh, This one is. The statement, Hugh Glass, the famous trapper and frontiersman, traveled 150 miles to Fort Kiowa, or please don't kill me on the pronunciation of that. Um, <laughs> I, I'm not certain. False. I think it's Kiowa. No, no, <laughs> it's false. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, traveled 150 miles to Fort Kiowa after being attacked by a bear and left for dead by his companions. Is that true, or am I blowing smoke? So the story, I'm pretty sure, is true. What I don't know is if the distance is correct. Yeah. Well, I've seen The Revenant, and mm-hmm. because of that movie, That's true. I remember both of us like diving into the story of Hugh Glass. Yeah. Like, this guy is cool. Yeah. He's a different breed of person. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I don't know if the technical information... I'm going to go true on that. I, I would go okay. true as well. True. That is blowing smoke. Darn it. So <laughs> Hugh Glass traveled... 200 miles. I knew it. It was going to yep. be a so technical, technical thing. Technical I knew data. it. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I told you. And the tricky thing is, it, it's hard because obviously The Revenant is the movie yeah. that yep. with Leonardo DiCaprio, but you don't know how, how much of the Hollywood has been thrown in because mm-hmm. Hugh Glass was a real person. Oh, yeah. But I know his story and the movie yeah. weren't exactly the same. Oh, so. I've heard of the movie. I've never watched it myself. Oh, really? I, yeah. Yeah. I, I just read about him just in, I think it was a gun magazine or sure, something. Yeah. And I read a lot of those. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, here's the thing, too. I mean, from my research into Hugh Glass, because I have found that The Revenant actually doesn't really do him justice as a oh, person. Sure. Like, he yeah. is actually even more... Because after that whole endeavor, there was another time where... Because he was actually... I think he was raised by pirates. Like, he was a, just... If you haven't looked into Hugh Glass, birth to death... It Most was an adventure. Like, yeah, I got chills <laughs> just thinking about it. Like, he is, he is an absolute cool dude. Like, to absolute, look into the truth and fact behind Hugh Glass. Mm. And, uh, like, he had did some epic stuff in his life. So Legendary. Um, yeah, and it's you know, you know you're cool when crawling 200 miles after being attacked by a bear and left for dead isn't the coolest thing you've done in your life. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure he you would know. have thought that was that cool. It's but, true. You know, it's probably, he was just surviving. It's a good story yeah, to tell it. when you're not dead. It's you know? true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but... I, I got to thinking, like, I wanted to put 200 miles in perspective for us. So I wouldn't even want to walk 200 miles if I hadn't been attacked by a bear. I know. Yep. So how far do you guys think 200 miles is from our, our town? Like, how, where do you think you could get in 200 miles? Well, I can tell you, you'd be darn close to Portland. You'd be around about Hood River, I think. Somewhere in there. That's a long way. That's a long way. So 200 miles is almost exactly to Portland. Really? Um, oh, it's like 240 something Yep. And it's, it well encompasses... Uh, Boise is well inside that. Coeur d'Alene is well inside Spokane. All of that is well inside. So you're you're really tra- traversing half of Oregon or more. Yeah, Bend is inside of that by a good oh amount. My wow. Gosh. And so mm. just think about like, and obviously in your area, you can go online and you can look up like a little radius thing, and yeah. <laughs> it'll just say like 200 mile radius <laughs> from my location, and mm. you can see then go, that is a long, long way. Then to go, go find a bear. <laughs> Give it a hug and see if you can and crawl then, that far. Yeah. No, I yep. don't do that. I was kidding. That's, <laughs> that's, we for, do not, we do that's not a joke. We don't that. condone you doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Leave the bears alone. Okay. That's right. Yep. Respect right. them. Unless yep. you're hunting for them, in which course you can definitely. I would use a traditional muzzle. Absolutely. So, <laughs> Worked right for Hugh Glass. Yeah. That's yeah. right. For sure. <laughs> or maybe it didn't. I'm not sure. <laughs> 
<laughs> you should watch the movie. We'll, we'll talk I, about I it. I do, apparently. I'm, 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 He's a little I'm educated on this. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Awesome. Sounds good. Um, so on that, let's go ahead and dive into a little bit more of uh, just the models. We've gone over it a little bit. So let's dive into what models we recommend for traditional hunting. I would say our two most popular, I know in our in a past podcast, we talked about the Hawken rifles. You know, the Hawkins have just been traditionally yeah. very popular and they just great form and function. They look great and they're they're still going to take down any big game you you go at it. So mm-hmm. that would be my choice is is the Hawken in the flintlock or the percussion. They do sell models that that have both ignitions now. Yeah. yeah. And when he says Hawken, there's, that's a lot of different guns. Yeah. So check out our Hawken podcast. There you go. The top oh, yeah. Of the screen. yeah. And <laughs> there you go. Right. You know, somewhere up here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, there's, there's a bunch of, there's several manufacturers that make them. The two main ones that come to mind would be Traditions and Pedersoli. But I think Investor makes, yeah, they've got the Bridger yep. Hawken, the Gemmer. Yeah, that's a Hawken as well, isn't yep. it? So. And I think mm-hmm. Lyman makes some Hawken esque rifles. They're just not called Hawken the great rifles. Great Plains rifles. They yes, make. and they're yeah. not. Yeah. So it won't say Hawken on it, but it's the it's same. It's basically style. a yeah. Hawken rifle. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of different options for you. Different mm-hmm. twist rates, different ignition systems. So there's mm-hmm. even some that have like double set triggers. Most of them do. Some yeah. of them don't. So um, decide what you want to do. And yeah. You've got options, and you can spend I think as little as like three fifty, three eighty, somewhere in there, yeah. up to like fifteen hundred, two thousand dollars. So. Yeah. Lots of variants. Another model that I was thinking of would be the Kentucky rifle, which is a long rifle. Um, any any rifle named after a state, really, <laughs> are primarily are going to be, that, for the most the part, one? a long rifle. But the, just the, for our community, the Kentucky rifles have been extremely popular. And I know that they do make them in the kits as well. Um, and we have the, the flintlock and the percussion available. So mm-hmm. plenty of options. But yeah, those have just, for the price point and your huntability with them uh, yeah they've been very popular for sure yeah absolutely i think that you know pa pellet it's another state oh absolutely <laughs> the, yeah um the it's another great option that uh you know there's all kinds of different things the missouri um there's the great plains hunter from uh that's like the the lyman great plains hunter yeah. it's got a one in 32 i want to say yeah. Is that typically right? yeah Locked yeah um so you're able to use pretty much what you're looking for if if you're not wanting to stick specifically traditional then looking for something with a little bit faster twist rate so that you can yeah. use a conical bullet because that's going to give you a lot more uh, accuracy you have a little more versatility as far as the types of bullets that you can use yeah and you'd want to use like a mini ball is kind of mm-hmm. the style yeah. so it's not going to be until you get down to the, like one in 28 or faster mm-hmm. you could use a power belt type of bullet uh, you know, full bore conical. If you want full bore conical, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if you wanted to, in like a one in thirty two, it's kind of on the upper end mm-hmm. of of that. Sure. Uh, what you know, what that's designed for. One in forty eight, one thirty two. You know, kind of up in that range. That's yeah. really good for like a mini yeah. ball for. Yeah. Um, like the maxi hunter. Yeah, like the maxi Thompson. hunter. Any, great any plan. big ones, lead bullet. Kind of big yeah. conical, not like super bulleted. Mm-hmm. You know, not bullet shaped, but they're more yeah. just kind of a cylinder. Yeah. Um, yep. It's really what they look like. Yeah, those work pretty well with that uh, twist rate. Yeah, absolutely. And obviously your, you know, your round ball for the higher or the slower twist rates. Sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, and that's something to, to definitely keep in mind. We have gone over this before, so I don't want to yeah. beat a dead so horse. So watch the other podcast. Watch yeah. the other. Po- I don't <laughs> know what right. it's in, so I don't want to link it. But <laughs> we we definitely have talked about di- selecting twist rates and things like that. So yeah. mm-hmm. um, check those out. And with this, we we did talk about this. This was a question that came up for our Northwest Muzzle Loading Podcast. Um, so we'll cover it in this one too. So what is your maximum effective range now? Like it was in the last one, (laughs) very loaded question, but in general, like, what are you looking at? If you're using a Hawken with a one in 48, you've got a conical bullet. Are you looking at a hundred yards? You think, Uh, you know, what would you recommend to, to customers? What I typically recommend with that kind of a setup, 80 to a hundred yards. Mm-hmm. It's pretty standard. As your yeah. maximum. Yes. You can shoot it further than that. Sure. <laughs> what you're going to find, though, is it's going to be hard to hit exactly where you're wanting to shoot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. These aren't. So this is where it gets a little more challenging, <laughs> right? This is like the difference between your compound bow and your traditional mm-hmm. recurve bow. Yeah. You know, compound bow, you can pull it up, you can aim, mm-hmm. right? So you can shoot further, and they have a little more power to them. Those other style, you got to come up and just let it go. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, with this... You know, your inline guns can shoot 
typically, and it depends, right, on which gun you're using. But if you're using like a like that Traditions Hawken mm-hmm. muzzle loader, let's say, uh, yeah, that gun is gonna be, you know, with like 70 to 100 grains of powder. You know, 100 yards is probably gonna be your maximum effective range. Mm-hmm. It can carry further, obviously. Sure. But if you, you know, you gotta make sure you can hit the kill zone still. Yeah. You're shooting it like a pie plate typically with these type of guns more than yeah. like, hey, I'm, I'm one inch grouping. You might be able to do that with some of the Petter Soli guns, but most of them aren't built for that. Yeah. And a pie plate is like a 12 inch group. Yeah. Which right. To a lot of modern <laughs> center fire shooters, it's, it's like, like well, that terrible. is not a good group. But yeah. for a traditional, that's perfect. So yeah. you got a half inch wide bullet, so that right. helps you out. <laughs> so the, the, the closer you can get, the better. So it's like yes. a lot of people will, will go for a 20 to 50 yard shot mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. with it's like if i have a chance at 100 yard i know i can but it yeah. yeah wouldn't really reach farther besides you're using open sights anyway mm-hmm. right for the most part and so so you're pushing it once you get yeah. past that range you know and for sure even if you've got a good open sight set up yeah 200 is the furthest i personally would feel comfortable shooting i know some people can do better sure. than that obviously mm-hmm. but at a live animal that you want to make sure you're putting an ethical shot on you're pushing it you know, yeah, I think yeah. past 100 with that gun. Now, if you switch to, like, the Petersoli Missouri River Hawken, that's got one in 24, you're shooting a mm-hmm. modern bullet out mm-hmm. of it. That gun is going to group really tight for you. You could probably shoot, if you're capable of doing it with open sights, then you can yeah. probably shoot a one-inch group at 100 yards with that gun. Yeah. But it's still hard because you're still shooting with yeah. open sights, right? So you, that one can push you further. Mm-hmm. Um, but it just depends on, you know, you got to know what your gun's capable of doing sure. and what you're capable of doing. Yeah. And just because you can doesn't mean you should. Exactly. You know, Absolutely. It's just like just because you can take a 70-yard shot with a bow doesn't mean you should do it in yeah. you know, almost any circumstance. I mean, right. if if something is standing completely broadside, all the conditions are perfect, you are comfortable, your gun is comfortable, you've practiced at that distance, Yeah, you know, that is where that's where it's on you now you know that's the ethics side where it's on us Mm -hmm. is this is what is possible and this is what is recommended now take that information and go practice and what i was going to say is kind of circling back to being prepared and practice is go to the range with your gun yes don't don't take our word and say oh they said 100 yards go out to a hunting scenario Mm -hmm. and you're shooting your your percussion rifle for the first time at 100 yards (laughs) so go do your research go to the range Put a few hundred round balls through it or conical bullets, whatever, and yeah, figure out what your gun shoots, how it shoots, and and where you are going to achieve your best accuracy. Yeah, and I just also want to offer an encouragement. Don't be discouraged when, especially with you're just getting in traditional mm-hmm. guns, they, they're very different. They're, they can be pretty squirrely compared to yeah. some of the newer guns. So um, even though they're made brand new, right, they're still built on those old designs. Yep. So uh, be patient. Be mm-hmm. patient with yourself. Be patient with yeah. your rifle. It is yeah. a good gun, and it will do what you need it to do. You just kind of have to figure out what yeah. it needs, right? Yeah. And every gun is unique. So, uh, just because your you know your buddy at the bench next to you is is hitting a six inch group at fifty yards, shooting you know eighty grains of two F powder and you know a, a, a lead round ball, that mm-hmm. doesn't necessarily mean that's exactly what your gun's going to use. Yeah. yeah. So you just got to figure out what's going to work best for your rifle generally speaking there's some you know good places to start yeah Mm -hmm. so like that 70 to 100 grains you know is a pretty good area to be in yeah Yeah, absolutely and uh it also your powder charge is going to depend on whether you're using a round ball or a conical too you know and so there's all kinds of different variables um so with that if you have questions on on what we've asked today definitely give these guys a call yeah, um, for sure. We're actually going to wrap things up because we got to get you guys back to customer service. That's right. So, <laughs> um, yeah. So, yeah, this traditional muzzle loading, it's a great way to challenge yourself. It's a great way to stay in touch with your roots um, and just try something different. Try something new. So, uh, with that, we're going to wrap it up. Um, remember, follow us on social media. Check us out on Instagram, Facebook. Send me a message. I'm always happy to chat with you guys. I always love it when you comment and uh, get to see your guys' jovial natures in the comments. So, uh, yeah, remember, stay tuned for next episode, and we will see you next time.